follow, it means to either conform, comply, or act in accordance with, to literally imitate or to copy. So then why do we think when Jesus said, follow me, he meant raise a hand, sign a card, or show up at church once a week? When Jesus said, follow me, he wanted people who imitated him, who conformed to him, who looked like him. He wanted us to drop everything, radically change our lives, and yield to the unknown. He wanted us to follow, to go where he goes, to do what he does, because he's bringing his kingdom, and the only thing he asks is, will we follow? It is good to worship with you at the refuge. It's so good to, to be a part of this service and what we're trying to do here. Um, we are starting a brand new series this week called Following Christ. What does that even look like? Where do we even begin? Maybe, maybe we can answer some of these questions over the next four or five weeks. Hopefully we can, um, these and other questions. But today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there if you would like. Uh, specifically going to be in 2.14 through 18. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, uh, it will be up on the screen once we get there so that you can follow along um, and know what's going on there. Uh, I do want to say this. If you don't have a Bible, like a hard copy Bible, and you do want one, um, we buy Bibles just to give them away. So if you're interested in one, uh, come find me or one of our other leaders. We would love to get you a Bible uh, for this today just so that way you can have a hard copy of it so that way you can do that. You also can download it on your phone as well. There's a lot of Bible apps out there. I think the version is probably the best. Not an endorsement, just saying. Um, but there you go. But before we get into our passage for today, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever had anything go wrong in your life? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Of course you have. You ever had something go like the way that you didn't think it was supposed to go and you showed up and it just was completely not the way that you wanted it to be or expected it to be? Of course we have. We've all been in situations like that. Maybe you are driving along uh, in your car on the freeway or even in Norman and how wonderful the construction is, especially in Lindsay. Yay. Um, maybe you're driving along and the person in front of you or beside you thinks that they are at the moment more important than you are. And so they decide that they're just going to swerve over in your lane really close in front of you, cutting you off, maybe having you hit your brakes. Anybody ever been in a situation like that? Yeah, or maybe you were up for promotion at work and for whatever reason they decided to promote Larry. If there's a Larry in here, I'm sorry, I'm not making fun of you. If there, maybe they decided to pro, promote Larry over you and instead, and Larry is not as qualified as you are. It's not a knock against Larry, but he is not you and you're better at the job than he is. You've been there longer than he or she has, but whatever, for whatever reason they promoted him over you. Things just don't go our way. How do we respond in those situations? Probably anger, maybe frustration, maybe even complain a little bit, gripe, criticize, maybe just a little bit. Okay, if we're being honest a lot, all right? Some of those feelings overflow inside of us. And today in our passage, Paul addresses this with the church. He is writing to the church in Philippi. He's writing to the believers, those who follow Jesus. And he's actually writing to them um, from, from prison in Rome. And he's writing to them to thank them for the gift that they had. See, Paul went there, established the church. They were, Paul and them, grew, he, they grew really close to his heart. He had a fondness for this church. And so they were able to help him in ministry. They would send him gifts to help him in ministry. And so he decided, you know what? I'm in Rome. I'm in prison. I might as well write them a letter thanking them for the gift. And you know, as he's writing the letter, he's like, you know what? I've got their attention. Why don't I address some things? Why don't I bring some things up that I've heard and, and just kind of talk about it with them? So he starts to do this and he starts sharing his heart and he has this ongoing relationship with them, this fondness for them. And so he's writing them. And our passage today is actually a continuation um, from the previous passage, which is cha uh, chapter two, verses 12 and 13, where Paul says to continue working out your salvation and God will continue to work in you until the day of completion. And what he's saying there is he's not saying to continue to, to work and to, to earn your salvation because we can't do that. But what he's saying is continue to grow closer to and become more like Jesus. 
Because in the passage before, in verses 5 through 11, it's this beautiful prayer, and it's this beautiful passage of how Jesus humbled himself to become a servant on our behalf. And he's saying, continue to work out your salvation, continue to grow closer to him so that you will become more like Jesus. And then we pick it up here in verses 14 through 18. And this is our passage for today. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, in light of what he's saying there. Verse 14, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Other translations say the dark world that we live in. Verse 16, hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share in your joy. Now, there's some really good stuff in here today that I hope we can unpack together uh, and, and we can walk through this. There's a few things that I want us to focus on in this passage. And the first thing is this. As believers, as we're writing this, Paul's writing this to the church, all right? Number one, if you're feeling blanks, this is, we live our lives without complaining. We live our lives without complaining. Paul is telling this to the church to the believers, to the followers of Christ, don't complain, don't argue, don't let that characterize your life because that is not in your new nature. You are not like that anymore. This kind of lifestyle does not exemplify a follower of Jesus. Think about Jesus for a moment. Think about what he had go on in his life. <laughs> He was constantly harassed by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, right? Put on the spot trying to figure things out. He was run out of towns. He was even made fun of in his hometown. John chapter 1 verse 46 says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay, that's talking about Jesus. That's town folk saying, can anything good, I mean, really, come on, look at this guy. He's from Nazareth. Nothing good can come from there, right? And finally, he was falsely accused Oh, let's not to mention, he was betrayed by one of the 12 guys that said that they would follow him to the ends of the earth. He was falsely accused. He was put in prison. He was beaten. He was given a completely unfair trial for what, what, what he went through. All that just to die on the cross. And do we ever once see him complaining? We never see that. Because his mind and his focus was not on the here and the now. Look back at verse 14 with me. Do everything, we're going to get back to that word in just a minute because that's a killer word. Do everything without complaining and arguing. See, this is the thing that Paul does, and he's writing to the church. He's writing to fellow believers in Christ, right? And he says, do everything without complaining or arguing. What kind of sentence is that? Is that a question? Is that a statement? Is that an exclamatory or is that a command? It's a command. It's one of those things that's not just a suggestion. It's not one of those things that, oh, we read this and, oh, if I get around to that, that would be something that we could really, really do. No, he says, do everything without complaining and arguing. It's a command. It's an order. It's something that he expects that church and us to follow. Because that kind of lifestyle does not exemplify a follower of Jesus. That kind of nature is not in our new nature. And Paul is saying, I'm expecting you to do this. And not only that, what's that second word again? Do everything. He is expecting you and me, everything, every part of our like. Most of the time, if you can let this categorize, or every now and then, but if you get angry, then it's okay. He doesn't say that. He says, do everything without complaining and, arg and arguing. You see, our lives should not be characterized by complaining. Our lives have been made new. Our lives are different than what we see. And Paul is telling this church in this passage, and he's telling you, and he's telling me, 
do everything. Live your lives without complaining and without arguing. This is not a characteristic of a follower of Jesus. So do everything. We live our lives without complaining. The second thing that we can see in this passage, and this is the reason why we don't complain. This is the reason why we don't argue. This is the reason that we don't grumble and let that become a part of our lifestyle is because number two, if you're taking notes, we get to shine in a dark world. We get to shine in a dark world. When you're in a dark room and you need to see, you can what? Flip on the light switch and light unashamedly conquers the darkness, does it not? I mean, you can see because the light is on. If the electricity is not working in your house, you run to a drawer or something and you get out a flash light, right? Or if you're, you know, you get on your phone now and that type of stuff. But you get a light because light unashamedly conquers the darkness. And you and I get to represent that. You and I get to be the torchbearers for God. You and I get to be the torchbearers for Jesus. And we get to go into the dark world that we live in and shine his light. Look back at our passage with me. He, he gives us, don't complain, do everything without complaining and arguing. And then he gives us the reason in verses 15 and 16. Look at what it says. It says, so that, don't complain, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean Innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Verse 16, hold firmly to the word of life. Now, really quickly, I want to touch on that for just a second. Usually in the Bible, when it says the word of life or, or the word, it is talking about the Bible and the scriptures and its teaching. But Paul uses a different word here, and he's not just saying hold firm to the scriptures, but he's saying hold firm to the gospel. Hold firm to the good news that Jesus Christ died for your sins and for mine. Hold firm to that being your lifestyle. Hold firm to that being your focus. Hold firm to the word that brings you life. Because without the gospel, we're dead. We're lost. He says, hold firm to the word of life. Then, on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. The reason it is so important for us to live our lives without complaining, without grumbling, without arguing, is because we have been given so much. You see, you and I have been given so much. The gift of salvation has been offered to us, and we have accepted it. Let's make no mistake about it. The gift of salvation is offered to everyone. It is only when we accept it. And God has given us so much that complaining and arguing and grumbling and all of that kind of negativity lifestyle, that doesn't characterize us. That doesn't fit us anymore because in the eternal scope of life, we win, all right? There might be some bumps along the road, but in eternity, through Jesus Christ, we have won. And Paul is saying, don't complain because you get the chance to set the example. You get to be lights in a dark world. And when it gets tough, hold firmly to the gospel. Remember what God has done for you. Remember the grace that you have received, the grace that you have accepted. Remember that stuff because this world needs to see that. This world needs to see a difference. People need to see Jesus. People need to see the light of the world. And you and I as followers of Christ get to be those torchbearers. We get to be the ones who bring the light. So when you walk into a room and there are no other Christians in there, just like turning on the light switch or turning on your flashlight, you are the light walking into that room. We get to be that for him. So don't complain, don't argue, don't let that be characterized of you because we get to shine in the dark world. And when that happens, when people see that, when people start to notice that, number three, if you're taking notes, this is it, we represent the joy of Christ. 
Not only do we get rid of the complaining in our lives, but we fill it with something else. Like if we get rid of something in our lives, we fill it with something else. The joy of knowing our salvation, the joy that we get to have in experiencing that, <laughs> that is what fills us up and that is what people start to notice. Because let's think back for just a moment. Before you got saved, you were lost in your sin, you were without hope, and you were separated from God for all eternity. And there was not enough good stuff that you could do, there's not enough good stuff that I could do to get back to God. We, we were hopeless. It wasn't going to happen. But through Jesus and through the sacrifice that he made on the cross for your sins and for mine, he took your punishment and mine on the cross. And he says, it's as if you were never dirty. I've washed it away. That changes things in our life. That changes the way that we look at things and we get to represent the joy of God. Look back at verses 16 and 17 with me, or 17 and 18 in our passage, I'm sorry. It says, and this is Paul, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share in that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share in your joy. Now let me be very clear about one thing really quickly. I am not saying that once we give our lives to Jesus, that our lives are going to be nothing but rainbows, unicorns, and sunshine, okay? I'm not saying that at all. We live in a broken, fallen world. I think we can all agree on that. When that person cuts us off on the highway, we know we live in a broken, fallen world, okay? That's just how it is. We understand that. Bad things happen in this world, but our focus is not on the here and now. Our focus is not on things or stuff. Our focus is on Jesus, and Jesus won. Jesus overcame the grave. Jesus overcame and died on the cross so that you and I could have life in him. And that becomes our focus. That becomes who we are. That becomes what it is all about. Our lives, our primary focus is on Jesus. It is about growing closer to him and becoming more like him. And so when we read this passage and we think about all that he went through and we see Paul saying to believers, to followers of Christ, do everything, not just some, not just most, not just when you're feeling good, but do everything without complaining so that you can shine in the dark world that you live in because this world needs to see the joy of Jesus. And they're not going to see it in other lost people. It's just not going to happen. They're going to see it in your life and in my life as we live as lights shining in the dark world that we live in amongst the crooked and perverse people that it talks about there. Jesus never complained. Paul, he's in prison, falsely accused, by the way, again. He's in prison. And he chooses to write this church. He shares his heart with this church. He shared in the ministry with this church. And he shares in the motivation with this church that the reason that he can still be joyful is because of Jesus. The challenge today for you and for me is for us to continue to have that mindset. Let us be driven by the gospel, not by our circumstances. Let's pray together.